Welcome to the Wing Life Podcast, where we talk about wing foiling and the lifestyles of those who enjoy this great sport. All right, guys, I think we're good to go. Richard, big thank you for joining us today on the show. Really looking forward to talking with you. Great. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, for our guests at home, how long have you been in the, the wind industry? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm an old fella now. So uh, I've been in it my whole life. So I actually started uh, windsurfing at a very young age. I think I was 12 and I, I was uh, quite heavily involved in uh, the competitive side of windsurfing. So, you know, in my early, early teen years, I was already going to trade shows for various sponsors. Um, so I was actually, I think I was 15 or I mean, I think it was 17. I went to my first big trade show in Germany. It was the ISPO show for a windsurfing brand. So I was starting to to understand the uh, the sort of wind sport business. Um, oh, nice. And, yeah. Nice. And, and then which brands were you with at the time? Uh, I was sponsored. Actually, the probably the most interesting one, and I I believe it was a company called Rainbow, which was an Israeli brand of uh of windsurfing equipment so i actually went to it worked in their booth at that particular show but i had you know quite a few different sponsors uh back in the day i think it primarily in north america it was sponsored by mistral when i was in my early 20 you know 20s and windsurfing hawaii and um you know bear wetsuits and yeah all kinds of different sponsors so yeah Nice. Cool. Yeah. I, that's interesting about Rainbow. I hadn't heard of them before. I'm actually Israeli, so I'm going to need to brush up on my... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a company called Rotoplast. Um, they're, they're a big rotomolding company in Israel and so many so many companies, just like you're seeing now with with uh, wing foiling, you know, everybody saw the windsurfing exploding in the, the early 80s. So, you know, so many companies jumped in. I think uh, there was even Porsche, Porsche windsurfers and you know, Conley water ski had windsurfing boards, uh, you name it, they were all in there. We're seeing the same thing with wing foiling right now. Oh, yeah, it's just been a, a huge and massive explosion. What first brought you to water sports? Uh, well, I, you know, for me personally, it was, um, I, I was very lucky. I grew up, my family grew up in uh, Sydney on Vancouver Island. So I was, I grew up on a waterfront house. I've, I've never really not lived up on the water so it was always right oh, there beautiful yeah so uh even my even my high school was on the west and look out the window and see the wind blowing and i was out of there uh on, on my windsurfer so yeah just very very fortunate so water's always been there that's that's how it all started oh awesome nice. okay yeah so yeah. then you got sponsored you get to kind of ride around and, and and visit different spots in the world and and then what was your first introduction to the business world aspects yeah. of, of wind sports because you started pretty young age as well into there yeah so what happened was right after my my competitive racing I, I had a few job opportunities within the industry and uh, I didn't want to move away from Victoria for obvious reasons you guys are all moving here it's an incredible place to live and one of them was with whites diving uh, so they were a local manufacturer making wetsuits here in Victoria um, so as soon as I stopped racing, I think I was 22, I started working for them, uh, trying to sell and I was involved in trying to design wetsuits. The day I started, that company was acquired by Johnson Worldwide Associates, which is uh, Johnson Wax, essentially. Um, and then I was working for three years on wetsuits in the water sports market for a brand called Scuba Pro. And we also had a uh, water sport wetsuit lineup called White Hot. That lasted about three years. They um, they actually ended up moving their factory to Mexico, which freed up all the equipment and staff here in Victoria. People started getting, you know, laid off. Uh, my job was going to go the way of the dodo bird as well because they were they were moving everything to Ontario, and I I did not want to move okay. to Ontario. So mm -hmm. and, and anyway, I partnered with a fellow named Frank White Jr. and we bought all the machinery back. And we continued with the water sports wetsuit line. So I was, I think it was 25 and I ended up owning half of um, a new startup called White's Manufacturing, which was, you know, continuing on the legacy of the White family. Um, yeah. That's, and that's pretty that's, exciting at 25. Yeah. So we built that up yeah. and uh, it was in basically 2001 
or sorry, 1999, that I, we saw the first 98, the first images of kite surfing happening. And we all rushed out and like everybody else bought, uh, you know, power, power kites for land bugging and made our own control bars and did the whole MacGyver thing at the beginning because there's there was no equipment. Had a ton oh, that's of fun. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, and that's how Ocean Rodeo started. So Ocean Rodeo, we started as a brand in 2001 and started uh, Ross Harrington, who's a good friend of mine. And he actually taught me how to windsurf for us because he was much older. He was two years older than me. <laughs> OK, <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's that's the story right there. We sold whites in uh, 2010 to Air Liquide, which is um, uh, you know big French multinational, but they own a company called Aqualung, which is a big dive brand. So they okay. they bought our company for dry suits, and and that left me with Ocean Rodeo. We started uh, started with dry suits originally under the Ocean Rodeo brand. That. Um, that went really well. So we designed these really sort of funky looking dry suits for kiteboarding, new styling. And then uh, Ross came on board and started designing his kites. He'd been making kites in his garage. So uh, I went off to Asia and found a manufacturer and uh, got everything set up. And then we started producing uh, kites. So that was in 2002, we launched our first kites and control bars. Um, so we were one of the very first okay. brands in kiting. Okay. And then, um, yeah. And then what happened was that that industry got very, there was no change in, in materials. So everybody was using Dacron, uh, PU bladder materials and polyester canopy materials. And, uh, we sort we had, what happened was it ended up being a fashion show in terms of, there wasn't a lot of difference between the products by say 2015 to 2017. And to, to get ahead, it was just branding and, there was no real difference between the material, the, the kites. It was, it was really stacking up. So we sort of had a, a heart to heart meeting in 2017 and, and realized that there was an opportunity because there was no alternative to Dacron or any of these materials. Mm -hmm. And that's where the, that was the spark to, to uh, think, boy, maybe, you know, maybe we could design a new type of material. And fortunately, one of my business partners, uh, Peter Barang is, is a brilliant chemist and very stubborn <laughs> and, so, <laughs> you and, have no, to be. <laughs> and knew nothing about material which turned out to be a, a real benefit so he didn't have any you know baggage coming from a traditional mm -hmm. fabric manufacturer and he, he he went off to his garage and about two years later uh, he started hitting some pay dirt which be ultimately became a lula oh wow yeah that's an, that's an nice. exciting origin story yeah yeah. And um, so there you go. That's that's it. And then, of course, wing foiling came along. Um, that was that was an interesting one. So that uh, that actually was in a I was at a uh, um, industry event in Cape Town and I think it was 20. Where are we now? It would have been 2018, just before COVID. And I was with two of the uh, in a rental car with two of the other brand owners. We were going to a meeting. And they started talking about this new sport. I had no idea what it was. And, <laughs> and, uh, and I just, I said, what are you guys talking about? And, uh, one of them was positive it was going to be huge. And the other one said, it's absolutely mm. stupid, but we're working on it anyway. <laughs> so, Can, are, are you at liberty to disclose who those were? Who those no, were? no, it's uh, <laughs> confidential, but it's pretty funny. Oh, that's insider. <laughs> that's insider. But it, and I, I was like, wow, okay, so... Hmm, I kept my mouth shut and I started researching. And as soon as I got home, this is a tip off for them never to, to give away secrets to me in the car. <laughs> and um, we immediately started working on, on a wing. And uh, so we weren't that early in the wing game. We definitely were asleep at the wheel a little bit. Um, but uh, we, we did come out with the first, we, we jumped right in with a composite wing, which was, I think, a, a good move for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you waited long enough so that, it was a wing that was actually worth buying because a lot of those first gen wings companies kind of scrambled to get something together because they knew something was starting, but they hadn't developed it. And so a lot of those first wings were just kind of not worth much. Whereas I think the, the first ocean rodeo wing was already a pretty decent wing. So yeah, I don't think, yeah, uh, that's uh, you know, that's credit to, 
to Ross Harrington and um, you know, he's, he's an amazing designer. He's been doing our, our kites for 20 years, but before that he was windsurfing, um, designing windsurfing sails. And also he's a, he's, he was an avid uh, hang glider pilot as well. So he's got very good understanding of, of those types of shapes of, of wings that were basically what we're using are mini inflatable hang gliders. So uh, mm-hmm. he, he knew what he wanted to do right away. So uh, we're very, very lucky to have Ross working on this project. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we nice. did, we did, we developed all, by the way, we developed all of that here. Um, you know, that was all done just essentially it's Ross and myself because nobody knew how to wing foil when we were doing it. <laughs> so I, I, I think there was one other guy in Victoria that was hacking around. So while, okay. while we were learning, we were inventing the equipment, which is quite quite a funny way to do things but that's the way it was so hey that's kind of fun to be able to be at at the beginning of two pretty big sports then absolutely start kiting you get to see all of that aspect of things actually take part in development and growth and innovation and then take all that knowledge and passion and love and then dump that into this new sport which we have no idea where it's going to go but it's super exciting to see it explode yeah, very much so. I yeah, and it's it's really fun too. It's a lot like uh, the start of kiteboarding. There was a lot of design uh, that came along a couple of years into it, and you had to really carve out a section because uh, what happens is in all these sports, there's a lot of intellectual pop, uh, property that starts getting filed. So you've got to really mm-hmm. try to predict what's important and get a slice uh, in the intellectual property zone that allows you to operate because what, what can happen is you come in and um, you know, you're, you're doing something and you see something with another brand and go, Oh, that's great. We'll just do that. What you don't know is that there's multiple patents filed, you know, perhaps two years ago on that. And it can take three or four years for a patent to go through. So I predict that there'll be a, a big patent battle in this sport coming up shortly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's already started to be fair, you know, a duotone and the booms and all that kind of stuff. And it seems like companies have found a way around it, but initially that's the reason why only duotone had a boom wing because there was a patent on it at first. And I, I mean, yeah. you, you guys now have a boom, I think. Right. So how, how do you get, how did you get around that? Yeah. So concerned. there's, yeah, no, that's totally fine. Yeah, so there, when you understand how to read patents, you can you can under you know look at what they actually file, and you can break that apart. But uh, everything is basically um, is goes to claim one. There's a primary claim and a patent, and then there's all these follow-on claims. So as long as you don't fringe on claim one, um, you're usually fine. So you just have to look at what that was, and I believe that one they didn't have an inflatable strut. So it was a, uh, it was a yeah, but then there's a, lots of other patents coming through on handle systems. So mm-hmm. our, ourselves and certainly Duotone, I'm sure has lots of patents. So uh, yeah. eventually, so the, the handle system on the wings is turning out to be a bit like the, um, the safety system in kiteboarding where there was some big, big patent battles fought over the push away release um, in kiteboarding. Okay. So Anyway, it, it'll all work out. It'll all be fine in the end, but it is interesting yeah. to, to see. Yeah. It'd be nice if, because in kiteboarding now, that push away system has become pretty much standard and all of the systems are almost the same. Uh, it'd be nice if we can get to that point with winging where, you know, that the handles are basically all the same. And so you can, you know, have companies making really nice carbon handles and stuff like that. And you can bring it back and forth, kind of like fins, you know, for windsurfing and stuff like that. But yeah. I, I think it's going to take a little while still. So we get yeah, there. yeah. Well, we uh, I agree with that, by the way. And what what happened in in uh, kite surfing is there's an ISO standard now for the uh, the push away release. So if you want to sell okay. a kite surfing bar into a kite school in Europe, um, for the kite school to get uh, liability insurance, they have to use an ISO standard product. Um, so all of the brands now have push away releases so you notice that you know core had a twist which was excellent product but uh just the whole industry got together decided let's just do push away um there's not really 
that type of safety issue right now with wings. It's not like um, mm-hmm. you're getting hurled, but I think uh, perhaps ease of, like you say, interchanging handles, that could definitely be something. So a bit like ski boot bindings where you can use any, any pair of boots on any set of skis and bindings. Um, so mm-hmm. maybe, maybe something like that will come. Um, we yeah, have, totally. yeah, our, our matrix handle system is, is like that. And um, you know, it's uh, certainly if, if we, share that ip with other brands they can you know use our spacing use our handle um spacing and we could you could start to buy a handle from a different brand and put it on an ocean ocean radio wing I, I can see that happening yeah okay okay um did we want to kind of delve into a little bit maybe the v1 that came out for ocean rodeo and just see are you able to share maybe some of the the insights as to what what you found quickly while developing that, what was going wrong, what was going right, what that kind of thing. Sure, yeah. So uh, with the with the uh, can, or sorry with the composite materials, we you know we wanted to see how far we could push the diameters of the tubes, um, and and mixing that with higher pressure in the tubes, um, and that's called hoop stress. So basically, you're you know, you've got inflation, PSI, the smaller you make a tube, the more more pressure you need to get the same stiffness. And so what we did was we we absolutely pushed the diameter of the the struts and the leading edges down as far as we could using our, you know, most up to date um, Alula materials. Um, okay. And that was that was a really interesting process. We've also done that with our kites. So you start mm-hmm. to learn the different, and it turns out that diameter does trump um, it does trump stiffer materials. Like you can get much more stiffness by, and you can by getting more air pressure in there, for example, in a stiffer fabric. So that was something, and and I think pretty much every other brand has played around with this as well. So there's a real okay. a fine line. We we pushed it all the way, and right now I think our leading edge tubes are about a third third less in um, circumference than you would see with a t- traditional DAC round wing. Um, mm-hmm. So that's that's great aerodynamics. Uh, you, you're using less material, so it's lighter. Plus mm-hmm. the composites are already half the weight. So, um, so that was a big thing. And then tensioning of the canopy is another one. How, how, mm-hmm. um, you know, how, how is the ocean rodeo wing look so clean and, nicely tensioned and and that's that took a lot of work by Ross you know and it's just a lot of really interesting tensioning of the airframe and how the canopy reacts um and then and then of course we're moving into composite canopy materials right now which you'll see coming out from us very very soon and literally within a month there'll be the first uh, Lula canopy products out there and and again you're dealing with materials that react completely differently than uh than say Tasian polyester ripstops, it's very stretchy. Stretchy. Mm-hmm. Um, now we've got these materials that don't move; like they're, they just don't move. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's pretty fun, and they're lighter and stronger, and all those things. Yeah, does that help at all? <laughs> that helps a ton, and yeah. um, we're super stoked to see kind of that new next wave of materials come out. I know Tom and I have talked about it. We like to geek out on it a little bit and stuff, and to see what's coming down the pipe because the first main wave of wings for V1s and everything, it, it was canopies would stretch relatively quickly. And there were certain spots on those wings um, that would herniate or handles would blow off. Or So it's been cool to see those those big transitions from first to second to kind of even third year. And um, so we are looking forward to seeing what's yeah, going to come out with, uh, with all these different um, kinds of materials. Yeah. So what, what we're finding on also on the wing side, like we've, um, you know, durability is huge. So they, the wings take a bigger beating than, than kites do. And especially just coming in contact with the hydrofoil. So the other nice thing, mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but I, I, I pretty much rip depending on the conditions. I put a hole in my canopy, especially in the surf. I'd say every time I go into breaking surf, I rip my canopy. <laughs> so something happens. Yeah, sounds about and, right. Yeah. Right, and- <laughs> yeah. If it's, if it's big enough, that that's basically the game. And unfortunately for me, every time it's an Epic session, I end up tearing a wing in half and it's, it's kind of not that fun. 
No, <laughs> exactly. So they, these new canopies are are really exciting because you you literally can throw your wing. I, I, I don't want people to do this, but I mean, you could lay your wing on top or hit, hit your wing. And even if you did manage to puncture through, it's not good. It's not going to prop, propagate. So uh, you could continue your session with a with a slice. The other nice thing is that uh, they're they're all heat fusible. So with it, literally with a ski iron, uh, you can repair this and then put a patch on and you're back on the water. So um, so we really worked on this so durability of the canopy, serviceability. Um, and then, of course, bladders are the next big one. And everybody's had uh, problems with bladders at the beginning of um, of kiting. And mm -hmm. it's not it's not that there was anything wrong with the bladders. It was just learning how customers handled the product. So what what we all okay. learned was, uh, you know, kite boarders lay their kite down on the beach. They hook a line to it and they pump it up. So the, the, the product is, is inert. It's, it's just laying out and you pump it up. Wingers, especially new ones, will hold it by the wing by the handle. They'll hold the pump and then they'll pump it. And while they're pump shaking the bladders down inside the airframe, and as they pump up, the bladders are pinching and doing all kinds of weird things. So, so in, you know, the first year of, um, of our wing anyway, and you, you'll notice that there's all kinds of support strings and things like that now on wings. And that was all... As, as we learn from what customers were doing. So yeah, it's just interesting how things evolve. Totally. And I'm, I'm really curious because we started talking about Alula and the new material and stuff like that, we see a lot of uh, other brands coming out of with their own kind of, you know, Dacron um, alternatives to materials like Kupipa and, and Weave and all that kind of stuff. So what makes Alula different from those materials? Yeah, good question. Uh, so basically the the world makes composite materials uh there's uh, the hukipa type materials there's uh kuban fiber which became dsm composites um so essentially what they do the, there's a core fiber in those in those materials it's very very strong it's called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene and that's a um, a, a, a miracle invention and uh nothing sticks to it that's the problem it it is uh there's no glue that sticks to it there's there's really no way of making a laminate with it so what uh, has been done in, in the past and all of our competitors do they'll they'll have to mix in a a ratio of a different type of fiber perhaps a polyester or something like that so it might be a blend of, you know, 60% ultra high molecular weight, 40% a different fiber that might accept a glue. And then what they do is they support all that because ultra high molecular weight is very, very slippery. It, with it, if it's not supported with some sort of a film or something, it'll, it's just like fishing net. It just slippery and slides all over the place. So the video is they'll bond a uh, supporting film to it. So that's right now. So um, what and what that does is you're um, you're dealing with typically at least two or three different types of polymers, types of plastics. So you might be using a mylar, which is a, a PET film polyethylene therophyllite. Uh, you'll be using a ultra molecular weight PE core, and and then the glue, which is who knows what that is. So some sort of glue that they've developed. What Alula is, uh, because uh, we didn't know anything about that process, we did it completely different. And that's that's what our intellectual property is all about. We we have figured out how to, uh, it's called fusion bonding. So we're bonding these layers at the molecular level. And it's very difficult to do that. So you've got to use, it, you know, heat's involved, obviously. Uh, but if you're, you know, if you've ever taken a piece of uh, kite line or rope, and you you try to heat it and you know put a flame on it or something what happens to it it instantly shrinks up into nothing so nobody's ever figured out how to do what we've done so anyway what we do is we use um, molecular bonding we try our best to use all the same polymer group so that the materials are recyclable this is really a big deal for us we're um 
you know, we're not 100% there yet, but all of our new materials coming out called Aris X, they're all a single polymer group, fully recyclable at the end of, of their life cycle. And, um, and that's also okay. brand new to the world, really. Nobody else is doing this. Um, and not it's not a, even just a story. So we're actually able to take these scraps and basically it's a loop. So we're already producing, starting to produce our first uh, recycled product, which is a fiber board, which is quite exciting. So um, oh, cool. anyhow, so, so we don't. So tell glue. us a little bit more about that. That's really interesting because as you're saying, that's unique. Nobody else uses their scraps like that. Nobody else can use an old kite or an old wing. So you're able to take all of the Alula material or the new materials that are coming out and I guess melt them down or something to that effect and remake new material that way? Exactly. So um, first of all, scrap, I think we're, you know, when we when we uh, produce, we can produce up to 50 meter long sections, which is also quite unique. Some of, you know, some can can produce only I forget which one it is, but some of the brands can only do about seven meters long. It's hard to make this stuff. So anyway, we can do quite quite long sections, but our um, our usage of the material out of a, out of our rolls is like um, it's over ninety nine percent. So we've got very very little waste. So that any waste on the out of production can be chopped up because it's all single polymer and then turned into our first product that we're working on is this fiber board. Um, and uses for that is quite interesting. That could end up being like sidewalls for skis. Um, it could be uh, sidewalls for twin tip kite boards. It could be thermal foreign right. handles for wings. It's it's really cool stuff. We think it also has potentially some uh, some um, potential in the ballistics market. So we haven't properly tested that. That's that's a different market altogether. But it's quite interesting. And then. End of life. We haven't set this up yet, but one of our big goals is um, because we're also working with brands outside of the wind sport market in outdoor <laughs> sport is where we would like to eventually have a closed loop. So end of cycle, end of life cycle products can be, you know, returned and disassembled and we can get those materials back because because we can use them to make new products. It's, it's really cool. So we want we want them back, <laughs> so, but uh, that we're a few years off from that full cycle, but it's coming. Um, one of our products that we're about to launch, you could actually just recycle with your uh, your milk cartons, your plastic milk jugs. Um, so that's another exciting one. So you could just take it to the uh, the recycle depot. <laughs> Oh, cool. Because that's yeah. one thing Tom and I we've talked about before, right? Was a little bit of of the end of life kind of stage because we were going through equipment relatively quickly. Uh, but it's cool to see that there's some innovation coming for that. Yeah, I mean, right now you cannot recycle Dacron. It all goes to the landfill. Mm -hmm. You can't recycle polyester ripstop. You can recycle the PU bladder. So that's uh, that is one good thing that we've got going for us. So. Okay. And, and okay. I think it's beyond end of life products as well. I think when we were talking to you uh, a couple episodes back, you mentioned all of the warranty stuff that he repairs and mm, the buybacks and stuff like that. There's a lot of companies, I don't know if a lot of people listening know this, but a lot of companies when you warranty, say a board or a wing or whatever, you actually, you need to destroy it. That's part of the warranty process is you destroying the product and you getting a new replacement product. And that's really a company policy because there's some companies that decide to sell the product at a reduced rate. Some companies decide to repair it and then, you know, give you the repair price, whatever. So it's really a company policy. And I think that it's nice to see companies taking responsibility for warranty issues without destroying the gear. Because often you're destroying brand new gear that could totally be used still. It just needs a repair. Yeah, so that's that's true. So we just actually launched our rewrite program. I don't know if you've seen that, um, which is uh, it's it's going really well actually. So what we're doing is if um, if there's a demo kite or a warranty, you know, damaged product, we're we're getting those back, and what we're doing is we're fixing those up, and if they're sellable in decent enough shape, we actually sell. We're trying to keep our products going as long as possible. It's probably mm -hmm. ultimately for business, maybe not the smartest move, but I think um, 
you know, the disposable, we need to start using our products longer and recycling as much as possible. So anyway, that's the first step in that. We're, we're already doing that. We just launched that about uh, two months ago. And okay. uh, products that we can't resell, this is really great. We have a local company here. Uh, it's, uh, what are they called? Oh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Anyhow, they recycle. We take all of our used kites and wings there, and they t- are turning them into um, bags and backpacks. We just donate them for free. And you can go to... Oh, yeah, the, I heard you, about that. Yeah, if you go to our... Re- yeah. There's a few companies around the world doing this, but these ladies mm-hmm. are doing a wonderful job. If you go to our rewrite program, you'll see at the bottom a line and buy... Uh, uh, Ocean Rodeo Wing turned into a beautiful backpack. <laughs> and there's even a Lula in there. They've got some Lula scraps. It's really cool what they're doing. So Oh, nice. Yeah. We ask everybody this and and kind of because you you did help start this for Ocean Rodeo, what was your first foil ride like? And and what did that feel like? And what did it feel like to ride that first wing? And what did they conjure up same feelings as kiting? All kind of curious. Uh, foil ride on a wing or foil ride on other sports like kiting or yeah just maybe your first foil ride and then maybe we can throw the wing in after sure yeah so my i i had a hard time learning how to hydrofoil i had my bought my first hydrofoil in 2003 from uh, carafino which was the very i think they were the first brand to do uh, kite foil boards um there i think it was italian brand and our british distributor was was selling them and he came okay. to visit us in canada here and uh, we all went to Nittnat lake which your friends about killed myself there i couldn't do it and then i tried it at our local spot at home and i got tangled up in the kelp with the hydrofoil oh yeah <laughs> and i i honestly <laughs> oh, yeah. never tried it again after that i just thought oh, this is ridiculous okay. um I should have stuck with it though. <laughs> so, and then I uh, I tried the next time I actually got going was in Mexico. I, I don't know, 2015. I was I had from Nobile. I had a Nobile hydrofoil board, and it was I could I was a okay. uh, the walk of shame. I couldn't go downwind. I kept getting stuck upwind because I, I couldn't bear off. I kept wiping out, so I had to walk back. Oh, the yeah, opposite. That was you know? so tough. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that that's how I started, and then um, that was on a kite, I'm guessing. Hey, yeah, kite say. kite foiling. So I'm not a very good kite foiler. I can go. I'm a. I love kite foiling in light wind. Like I absolutely love it. So winging is. Uh, we haven't quite got the gear dialed down yet to go as as fast and efficient as you can. On a you know a 14 or seven on a on a race hydrofoil. I mean, you can go mm-hmm. so fast, and it's so fun. I just love that. So so. Um, that's kind of where I do most of my kiting now is, is just in the light wind. I love it. Um, but okay. winging, yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I bought actually from Raphael Sells. He set me up with my first uh, hydrofoil setup, which I still use today. I still use the F1 gear. Uh, and I also, with uh, Till Aberlay at Duotone, I've got a, um, some of the Duotone uh, boards and wings that are hydrofoil equipment. And the big difference now is I just cannot believe how great the hydrofoil designs are compared to so easy to use compared to what we had. <laughs> they're uh, they're fantastic. So it's a great time to get into winging um, for sure. Like it's it's nice to have something predictable and, you know, not uh, jumping out of the water all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. That's a really good point you're making there because um, I also started not quite as early as you in 2003, but fairly early on with you know early slingshot stuff and stuff like that, uh, and early Neil Pride stuff on the windsurf foil front. And man, is there ever a difference uh, compared to those foils, which aren't even that long ago. You know, we're talking six years ago, seven years ago, and it's changed so much. It's so much easier now, so much safer, so much more user friendly. And stuff's not breaking as much anymore either, which is nice. Because those yeah. first foils, they're just blowing up. <laughs> yeah. And you talk about the wow factor for me. So the, I think the big wow factor for me, where we live in Victoria here, we have fantastic shop in front of the city. It's a, a very tidal area. And we get these, you know, west winds. And if you get the tide moving into the, into the wind, we get these beautiful sort of, you know, waist to shoulder high standing chop and I knew uh, I remember catching my first sort of chop and I 
was so surprised at how much energy there was in a wind chop. I didn't even know it was there. And um, mm. we all surf here on Vancouver Island. So I know what I know what the feeling is to get in the pocket on a beautiful, really powerful wave, uh, you know, with 50 other people out there trying to catch the same wave surfing. And, and all <laughs> yeah. of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got the same sensation on a knee high to waist high chop i've got the same acceleration down the line i felt like i was surfing and that's like wow okay wing foiling to be able to turn the wing power off get that foil position in the you know the top section where the energy is and and have the whole ocean to play in it's like an open surf break um that's that's what winging is for me for sure and that's what hooked me yeah yeah, I 100% agree. That's exactly what got me on winging as well. I was living in Montreal at the time and kind of the same as you guys. There's no waves. There's maybe little tiny wind swell uh, if it's blowing like 35 knots. And the second that you get on a, you know, even on a kiteboard, you could kind of slash it a little bit, I guess, but you're mostly just riding flat water and pretending to turn on, on a wave. Whereas on a foil, you're actually using the energy of the wave. You're actually surfing the wave. And it, as you say, it's, uh, you know, it feels three times as big as it is and three times as fun. Um, yeah, that's really cool. That really makes it, you know, surfing accessible to people that live inland or people that live in places where there's not good wind on waves because it's not everywhere that you can find that. That's um, really, yeah, really I, cool. I love the fact that you can be on a, you know, an 85 centimeter mast and you're on, you know, maybe a one meter high chop, but you add those two together, you're two meters up now, looking down only a small exactly. chop, but it feels like you're on a head high, dropping in on a head high wave. It's so fun that it it sort of accentuates everything and, and makes uh, mediocre conditions really, really fun. So uh, yeah. For I sure. And, and there's that projection you were talking about as well, right? Because on, on any sort of board, regardless, you know, surfboard, wind surfboard, sup, whatever, you need some energy in the wave to get over all that friction that you have on the board and because there's so little friction and because there's so much energy under the water uh, that you can harness with a hydrofoil, you really get that feeling of the wave pushing you forward and, and uh, the acceleration that you get out of a much, much bigger wave. Uh, yeah. Otherwise. Yeah. yeah it's, it's awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm really, really enjoying what the uh, GWA are starting to do. They're, uh, I don't know if you saw the last event, they're starting to push um, sort of in the waves, dropping, you're not, you're not supposed to touch the back handle, which I think is, is quite fun. And what I'd like to see them do, though, is uh, in the wave riding is start to have events at the gorge, for example, uh, would be mm -hmm. just pure chop uh, wave riding events and really see that develop. Because, you know, most most people are in the chop right now, I think. And get out of the crowds and the surf lineup. You're not particularly welcome in a great surf break with a hydrofoil. So um, yeah, it's very exciting. Great future ahead. Yeah. Especially if you have a wing or a kite or a sail in your hands and you go into the surf spots, they're not happy about that. Exactly. And I mean, I get them right. Like who wants to be sitting around waiting for waves while you have somebody beside you catching all the waves because they have a better tool. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's, that's really cool. And I think it's, um, you know, I've kind of personally gotten into a little bit the same kind of mindset that I have with windsurfing where I'm always looking for, you know, like really good side off winds and, you know, more powerful waves and all that kind of stuff. And I just my, had a session here a couple of days ago where it was just chop, you know, like just like not even knee high. And I forgot how much fun that is. Like if you have a little bit of wind in your sail, you can really have fun on just that, which is amazing. Like it's, yeah. it's so much more accessible. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Absolutely. Richard, how does it feel to like, you may be looking back as when you started this, did you ever think that your companies would grow to what they are? Did you think that, that your product would have such an impact on people's lives? Like if we look at water sports and wind sports, like, they can change and and completely amplify and bring so much joy to people. Um, I know it's a bit introspective, but have you ever thought about that kind of aspect uh, of your job? You know, it's funny. It's um, I've had other people like it's funny because when you're doing this all day long for so long, you're just you know mm -hmm. super. It is ultra competitive, <laughs> yep. you know, and uh, 
it's it's like any business where we're scrapping every day trying to stay ahead of our competitors and and uh yep. So you do forget what you're actually doing. And what we're doing is, I, I think you're right. I think we're introducing people to, uh, you know, the, the wind and the waves and that, that lifestyle. And, and it, it is, I've seen a lot of people, um, you know, friends that just locally here that were not into water sports or kite surfing. And they've seen what I've been doing for years and years. And finally, you know, it, it's a 50 years old, this friend will go to, Turks and Caicos and take kite surfing lessons. And the next, yeah. the next thing, you know, I see him and, you know, he's completely changed. Uh, they're off to Brazil to do these do big down winders and all they can think about is kite surfing <laughs> or wing yeah. foiling or whatever it might be. So yeah. it is, it is great. And I think people that, that do these types of sports are, uh, are probably a little more responsible about, the environment and looking after things and uh, the changes we have to make in the future. So yeah, it's great. I'm really, it's fun. Um, but yeah. <laughs> no, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Well, especially with kelp and like we're in the ocean, like when I'm in Victoria, we're always at a Ross Bay or Clover point and stuff. And you're always in the ocean. So you're always looking around seeing stuff. And I've gotten caught in that beautiful kelp so many times oh. I'm freaking out thinking it's an orca, but no, it's just, <laughs> it's just kelp. <laughs> but um it is nice. Like, um, like for me, it completely changed my life. It, it gave me such a sense of joy and passion and purpose to, to learn something and then bring all those aspects into, into everyday life. Um, I was curious to see your vantage point on that. And I completely understand of running a business, you have to do things and it is competitive. And sometimes it's nice just to stick your head out for a few seconds to breathe at least. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. Exactly. But you know, the, the other thing is, and you, a lot of times people turn their passion when they turn their passion into, uh, into a business, they don't do the sport anymore or they get tired mm -hmm. of it. And, uh, I, yeah. I don't know, I've been completely the opposite. I, <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm a, I'm a maniac to get on the water. I'm still like a little kid. I mean, I'm, I'm watching the wind every day, trying to get out there. And I, I don't care if I'm surfing or stand up paddle boarding or kiting or winging to me, it's all just yep. getting on the water. And I do mix them up. Like I really do. I'm, I'm okay. totally, I, I pick, I pick the right tool for the day. And, uh, I, uh, I think that's a great way to be as well as to, to, you know, if you're hooked on hooked on kiting, and uh, you know, don't be afraid to give winging a shot or you know something else. It's it's really great to be be well rounded and uh, and and sort of open open up your eyes to other sports because quite often those experiences of being a good surfer or a good kiteboarder will come back or a great windsurfer. Windsurfing especially really helps wing foiling for sure. That's that's there's no doubt about that. So. Yeah, it's just great to mix it up. Mm -hmm. Like, um, like Tom, you started windsurf foiling, correct? Yeah, that was my first experience on a fall was uh, windsurfing. Yeah, yeah, and that was like, especially the style of uh, of windsurf foiling I was doing uh, when I was windsurf foiling. It wasn't really that free ride style. It was more kind of like strapless and smaller sails, a little bit bigger foils. Um, and the foils a little bit further forward. So that was really getting pretty close to, you know, a uh, surf style, let's call it. And I think there's, there's ways of doing that and making it really, really interesting. But I, to me, the second that winging came out, it was just like, yep, this is, uh, this is what I've been looking for, for a lot of conditions. But I do, I do like what you say about choosing the right tool for the right day, because there's a lot of different conditions. There's a lot of different spots and not every sport, well, no sport is perfect. So, you know, there's definitely conditions in which I prefer to be windsurfing. There's conditions in which I prefer to be kite surfing. There's conditions where, you know, supping is really the right tool. So it's nice to have all those different tools in your, in your garage if you can. Uh, and it's nice to learn new things. And as you say, there's a huge amount of cross, um, it's, it, all the skills you're learning in each sport are super applicable. That's why you, like all the pro windsurfers and pro kiters and all that, that they became pro wingers super quickly. And they're all pretty good at the other sport as well. You know, there's so many like Guito and all those freestyle guys are all super good at kiting as well. And, and 
Ayrton is a really good windsurfer as well. So it's a, it's all related. It's all interconnected. Exactly. Waterman. There you go. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's good fun. Talk a little yeah. bit about your team riders and see where they're at. And yeah, for sure. Uh, well, in on the winging side, of course, it's Mathis Gio from France, and uh, he's really our our only team rider. And I tell you, I've got a good knack of picking the right ones. Holy cow! <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So Mathis, uh, yeah. right when we started uh, developing our wings, we put out a little post that we were looking for some team riders, and and Mathis came along, and uh, he was just actually getting into winging himself. But I noticed on his resume that he was he had been world youth windsurfing champion, uh, and so I was like, okay, he's gonna he's gonna be good. So we grabbed Mathis, and sure okay. enough, he is. I mean, the guy is a bullet, and uh, nobody can touch him around the race course. Um, so nice. really happy with Mathis, and he's um, the fun thing about about him is he's using totally stock wings. Like he's not even using hard handles; he's using soft handles still. Uh, he's on oh. our six meter primarily is what he's using to race. And we actually designed that wing two years ago. We haven't changed it. Uh, we've upgraded okay. the materials a little bit, but he's still the last, the race, um, just finished two, a couple of days ago in, uh, in Le Cat, France, he's, uh, straight bullets, you know, took out everybody. And then, uh, before that okay. was the, uh, world's, the new, uh, course racing world championship, same thing. He, he cleaned up there so yeah really excited with Mathis and then uh, we've got a young man uh, River uh, who's in Tarifa he's very young and he's okay. he's I think he's 16 so he's okay he's just doing the local uh, Spanish scene right now but um, we'll see how things go but he he's the type of uh, athlete that could end up whether it's with us or another brand i don't know you know it's, it's hard to know when they're young like that but he'll definitely be uh be somebody on the pro tour soon i think so we're keeping okay. an eye on him um and then of course on the kite side we've got a great team as well so we've got um mm -hmm. uh, heel Vloot, who's was male rider of the year last year um trick of the year been to the double loop and then of course my son who's uh fifth overall in the world right now on the surf tour yeah phenomenal so, rider yeah and he's he's actually yeah. winging as well people don't know that but he is uh okay. he's actually working on he's an, a mechanical engineer so you know he's okay. you can see that you know he does all yeah. the handle parts and um oh, cool that's all him this is this is kind of cool too i'll show you this i guess see sure. this so that's a new part that Reese designed. He's got his first patent on this. This is a uh, quick release leash for wing foiling and surfing. So it's uh, oh okay. That's coming out in the next month. So you'll see these popping up everywhere. So how Ooh. that works is um, you pull this here, and it separates. Uh, oh, that's right front. So there's a hub. Beauty. So it's really handy for winging and surfing and kite, kite surfing where you're using a leash. Uh, to reset it, it's on a swivel. You just push and you're back in again. So, Sweet. Yeah, so you're using that as a, uh, a wrist leash or off. Your, you can wrap that around a harness or a waist leash. The swivel is great because your, your leash lines don't get twisted up um mm -hmm. surprising when you use this if you're used to using a leash without a swivel off the cuff you'll notice a big difference right off just with a swivel yeah, um, absolutely and then the other the other thing is um if you're getting tangles you know where you're getting a wrap between a, you know maybe a your board leash and your wing leash which happens pretty much to everybody uh it's rather than trying to unvelcro when you're on the water it's just a quick pull thread it through and snap it back in um, so really, oh, yeah, yeah really huge like, difference. Yeah. And also, uh, launching in the surf. So you definitely, I don't know about you, but I don't like to have, if I'm having to paddle out through breaking surf, I don't like having my uh, leash attached to my board with the hydrofoil. So I'll, okay. I just drag it behind and punch, punch through with my wing flapping away back there. And then once you get through, it's really quick to reach the, the leg rope and snap it, snap it onto your wherever you're connecting it to your calf, ankle, or your waist. 
So I think this is okay. going to be, um, we're offering this to the other brands as well. And um, I think you'll see that. I'm guessing that's going to become very much a standard item in wing foiling. So we'll see how yeah, that goes. Yeah, and I think even beyond that, uh, like you're saying paddling out, my first thought is instead of, you know, having your wing on your wrist and trying to paddle with that thing tugging on you, you clip it to the back of your waist leash, for example, that you're using for your board. And once you get out past the break, then you unclip it from there and clip it to your wrist. And there you go. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's a lot, a lot quicker. Uh, Even putting the band on your arm could be a lot easier if you don't have it connected to the leash. Like, very yeah, cool. absolutely. So that, I mean, we're all, uh, this has been in development for, for quite a few years, but um, the, the really, in, in kiting, it's great because in offshore conditions or certain surf conditions, you do need to use a board leash, unfortunately. Yeah. Totally. Um, but, and the problem with that is, as we all know, the worst thing that can happen is your board gets thrown into your lines. Mm -hmm. So your, 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 your ankle leash and your board are now through your front lines or through your bar. And that can be mm -hmm. super dangerous because it throws your kite into a kite loop and, you know, big disaster. Oh, so. Yeah. That's why it was primarily a uh, recent Bennett. It was they were competing at places like Ponta Preta and those offshore conditions with giant, giant, powerful waves. And uh, it's pretty, pretty sketchy using a leash there. Um, totally. So it was, mm. yeah, it was developed on tour. So there you go. That's a new product for winging. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Nice. Very cool. And I love that it's, um, it's a, kind of a passive arming, right? Like a uh, passive reloading. So you don't need to fiddle with something to go in and then flip something over and then stick it and whatnot it looks so clean and easy to do amazing and that's oh. all stainless i guess that's uh yep that's all all marine stainless yep yeah okay. it's uh yeah we do all the load we have load testers and all kinds of lab equipment here so everything's everything's tested to destruction <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what you need yeah yeah amazing that's what we need um what about uh, for those at home or even those and other, we have people listening all over the world now. And could we talk a little bit maybe about your, your home break or your home, your favorite spot on the Island. That's, that's not, um, that's not protected, I guess, by sure. the international privacy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> if, if anybody's ever had a chance to go to Tofino, uh, there's, there's just, uh, it's called Chesterman's beach and for wing foiling, it's tricky, but um, it, the, what you can do there is it's a bay and there's, it's called Frank Island. There's a sand spit and the break isn't that great for wing foiling in, in actually South Chesterman's. But what you can do is go into the middle of Cox Bay, which is the next bay over. And it, it's a really hard to get out uh, through the beach break at Cox Bay, but on a moderately big day, I wouldn't recommend doing it on a, on a huge day because the swell get does get massive in there but you can ride these giant swells in the middle of cox bay this would be for an advanced winger and not mm -hmm. even go close to where they start breaking so you're just staying on the outside but i did that uh first time i did that was last uh this time last year and my son was kiting in the surf and i was just staying on the outside i tell you it was it was un it was like riding giant mountains of water <laughs> it was it was quite <laughs> something so i that's a great area to explore. And then uh, okay. the whole Victoria waterfront is just, if you, if you mm -hmm. like chop or, or um, it, it's like identical to riding at the gorge. It's just breaking chop. Um, unfortunately, mm -hmm. we do get kelp in the summer. So uh, you've got to keep an eye open for the kelp monsters because that's not a lot of fun to get stuck in with the hydrofoil. So, uh, yep. and then of course, uh, all the wind machines that we have in the summer, Nitnat Lake, True. it's flat, flat water, small chop, but it, if it's sunny, it's going to be windy. It's guaranteed. Uh, so we've got Nitnat. Of course, China Creek is fantastic as well. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's kind of it. There are other surf breaks, but I'm not going to mention them. <laughs> no, fair enough, fair enough. And um, for those people looking for Ocean Rodeo gear, um, I know there's a couple schools. Um, I know that, uh, that Wind Rider carries your gear. Also, um, strong kiteboarding carries your gear. Um, are there any other spots on Vancouver Island? And then, um, obviously, your gear is everywhere else, but just kind of yeah. curious for people who are coming down there. Yeah, uh, Cadborough Bay, uh, there's a surf shop there. I think they're starting to dabble in our wings. So okay. that's right in Victoria. Okay. 
Um, okay. You can always order online, and uh, you know it is it's more expensive usually to order online through us, but you can order online and probably. I assume pick up from here, but um, it'd be okay. better to to get it through a retailer. Um, okay. Then you've you've got uh, who else? Juiced in uh, Courtney, I believe. Does, oh yeah, does some, absolutely. Yeah, so Comox kite repair. Yeah, yeah. And who else do we have on the island? I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, lots of great retailers all over the world. So absolutely. If, if any of those guys are listening, thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, we always like to give a shout out to those that are helping support because um, it being a retailer, it, it takes a little bit of work and effort. And, and um, we do obviously appreciate them for doing their part in this whole uh, in this whole sport as well. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We have a lot of listeners okay. in Ontario and in Quebec. So who who can they go to uh, to get their wings? I think 30 knots in Montreal works for yeah. you guys quite a bit. Absolutely. 30 knots and, uh, you know, silent sports. Uh, I, you know, there's, mm. there's a ton of them. So, a lot. Um, yeah. of course there's, uh, Adrian Splinter in, in Ottawa. Yes. Who's, uh, got his shop. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot. I, I should have there's a list a in front of me. <laughs> No, that's okay. It was just uh, just a quick little shout out to the retailers and yeah. stuff like that. Well, I think you know some exciting news for you guys. And uh, I can tell you this now, but Alula, sure. Alula acquired Ocean Rodeo. <clears throat> uh, okay. So they were separate oh, wow. companies. Uh, so Ocean Rodeo is is a division of Alula now, and Alula is oh, going wow. public. So um, it's no going. Way. Yeah. So it's going public. So you'll be able to uh, buy shares in Alula. Uh, starting next When's week. Your, uh, next week, your IPO is next week. Next week on the Toronto Stock Exchange cool. Ventures. So okay. uh, it's wow. been a long, yeah. So I think we'll be the first quote wind sport that started out of a wind sport anyway um, business to go okay. public. So you'll be able to to learn all about the wind sport industry by us being a public company. So um, hey, congratulations. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very no, absolutely. But but yeah, so it's um you know the comp- Alula of course has uh you know opportunities, well, great opportunities in wind sport, but also in outdoor and athletics and aerospace. So we're we're starting. That's why it's happening. There's uh it's really taken off in other markets as well. So should, should yeah, we talk? Talk, Sorry? We talk so, a little bit about those markets. Sure. I know. Can yeah. we talk a little bit about those markets? Because yeah. I know it's um. Like just wind sport, people will think, oh, it's just this, but there's so much more to Alula than than we ever thought. Yeah, absolutely. So we're, um, you know, I think the big, the the most interesting markets that are coming along are definitely in the outdoor space. Uh, there, you know, there's just like winging and kiting. When something's a lot lighter, especially if you're climbing or hiking, it, it's just way better for the uh, for the. Uh, the customer so making lightweight backpacks and you know lightweight ultra strong um components for the outdoor market is something we just uh collaborated with black diamond if you look at our website you'll see the new um it's called the vapor helmet for black diamond so we we actually did okay. all the, all the new impact uh composite material on that is made by alula so we managed to cut the weight of their helmet down I think it's like 20, 20%. So it's now the world's lightest climbing helmet, but it's also got, I uh, forget the multiple times of impact protection. So uh, we, we, we blew the Kevlar that they were using previously right out of the water in terms of saving weight and uh, improved impact. So we're seeing products. Oh, wow. Yeah. Products like that. Um, we're quite active in, uh, in aerospace. So you'll, you know, pretty soon when you fly around on a Boeing or a, uh, you know, Boeing jet or, uh, um, oh, I forgot what you call it. the, the ones from Europe, you might be without knowing it, you might have some Alula fabric around you. So there, there's oh, a lot, wow. lot going on there. Um, okay. and, uh, yeah, so there's, it's really interesting. So being light and strong is, is great. And, uh, if you're moving products, you know, transportation, anything like that, where you're, you're uh, using energy. Uh, there, those types of customers are coming to us to help improve their their efficiencies. Mm-hmm. So I think we're really we're really only at the at the start of this, aren't we? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, and recyclability. Um, you know, right now, like I said, the the entire world is based on manufacturing for the most part materials that are 
you know, woven nylons with, and then they put fills in them of different types of plastics. So it's really, really difficult. It's like a nylon pack material that your, your backpack's made out of that, that's going to go in the landfill. And that's mm-hmm. the way the whole industry is for the most part set up. So Alula is really, as, as far as I know, I think we're the only guy uh, process out there that can make these monopolymer without glue fabrics. So, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's uh, okay. opening up doors. Yeah, that's, there you go. That's amazing. And I, I kind of, we haven't really talked about sales for sailboats, but that's yep. another huge market that could totally use these products. Absolutely. We're, we're active in sailing. So uh, we, right now we're actually, our materials are racing around the world in the uh, ocean race. So mm-hmm. our, nice. we're, we're on, uh, our materials being used in, so the really high wear areas. So, <clears throat> you know, like bolt bolt ropes where the, the sail goes into the mast. Um, bags that are being dragged over the decks, you know, things like that. We're uh, ultra lightweight door frame doors that are on the, uh, the Amoka 60s. I don't know if you've seen those high speed uh, foiling boats. So we're, oh, yeah. we're being used on those, those types of locations. And plus we're, we're in development in uh, spinnakers right now with some really, really fast boats. So usually, typically it'll start on the high end. We'll, you know, they'll see what we can do on a, a fast racing yacht. If it withstands that, then it trickles down. So we've been working on these okay. projects for about two years. So we're, we're definitely in sailing. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I was going to say that uh, canopy material would be phenomenal as like a code zero or something like that for people that yeah. don't sail. Like code yeah. zero is kind of like a hybrid Spinnaker, yeah. which is a big balloon and a hybrid between that and like a normal head sail. Exactly. Uh, and uh, recyclable. That's that's the other thing. Yes. Um, no, no sailcloth out there. Actually, there is. There, there's some out there starting to happen, but all of our sailcloth uh, material that we're producing um, is recyclable. So that's something we're really we're going to stick to. Um, and for instance, yeah, on, I mean, uh, that's amazing. There's so much waste in sales. Like, you know, for me, I, I own a boat. And when you when you're done with a set of sales, you can give it to somebody to make bags out of it, maybe. But that's, you know, yeah. only if the sales is in pretty nice looking shape and, and it's hard to find. But there's so many boats with so many sales and they don't last forever, especially for racing boats that change sales really often. That's It'd right. be amazing to be able to recycle them. Yeah, so Vonde Vonde Globe that's coming up next year. That's the uh, the Amoka 60s that race around single handed. Um, they're they have a new rule. And I think uh, at least one of their sails has to be fully recyclable. So we're quite okay. excited about that. So we're hopefully be you know we'll definitely be on one of those boats in terms of certain components around the boat. But I'm hopeful that we'll get uh, hopefully we'll get a full sail on on uh, one of the Vonde Globe boats, which would be really exciting. If you ever watched Fonde mm. Globe or or the Ocean Race, get a chance to check it out. These guys are flying across the ocean at 20 to 30 knots, day after day whoa. after day. It's spectacular. Hydrofoiling. It's, it's oh, nuts. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, uh, Ocean Race is on right now. They're, I think they got uh, one leg left or one or two legs left. Okay. And that's it. Okay. Tom, you guys will have to talk. You're gonna, you could have the fastest boat in Martinique. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, I'm actually looking for a uh, code zero. So I'm like, man, this could be such a cool thing. But it's probably a little <laughs> bit out of my uh, racing budget. <laughs> wow. You're, you're in Martinique. I love Martinique. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it's Fort, Fort de France. Spot. Fort de France. The wind blows out of the valley there. Oh. Yeah, there's this yeah. huge funneling effect there. Yeah. And you get nice little swell or chop more like. Yeah. There and then the whole windward side, there's a bunch of surf spots and yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Best it's rum in the Caribbean. <laughs> That's what the Martinique uh, locals say, and I, I can't argue with them. It's really good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, hey Richard, if anybody wants to reach out to you, um, what's the easiest way for them to do that? And um, maybe a website as well. Yeah, probably uh, through the website, just the in, the info at alula.com or Ocean Rodeo, and it it uh, okay. it'll make its eventually it'll it'll make its way to me. Um, okay. And uh, I do believe we have phone numbers on there, old old school. Okay. 
Fair enough. Uh, There's nothing so, wrong with that. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're pretty good. We've, we're normal business. We operate normal hours and there's actually staff here and people running around. Okay. So yeah. Okay. So there you go. Sounds so, good. Yeah. Well, hey, hey, Richard, I want to say thanks a lot for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks for giving some of that insight yeah. and uh, sharing that journey of what brought you to here. We really yeah. appreciate it. Well, thank you for for uh, listening to me and and having me on your show. It's great. And I uh, really appreciate you promoting help, promoting us. And uh, it's great. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Oh, you're welcome. Cool. All right. I hope you have a great day. Okay. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye bye. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining Tom and I on this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. And we'll see you next time.